The other possibility is that cell size changes adaptively, and there needs to be a constant ratio between nucleus size and the rest of the cytoplasm for exchange of materials and so on. So the nucleus size catches up. And then the other possibility, of course, is that the bigger uh, nucleus actually causes a larger cell, or is causally correlated in some way. And I think at some level that has that third option has to be true, because if you look at, for example, these uh, samples from Siamese sweating fish and Australian lungfish, you can see that taking the same magnification, if I wanted to fit the nucleus, i.e. the genome, of this lungfish inside the cell of Siamese sweating fish, I have to make the cell bigger. It couldn't physically fit. So there has to be some, at least minimum, causal link between amount of DNA and cell size. You just couldn't have a cell this small if you had a genome that big, basically. Now, I don't want to give the impression that this is all based on blood cells, although that is one of the best study types of cells, in part because it's easiest to get. But it also applies to neurons and amphibians, where it's been looked at. It applies to a variety of different plant cells, different single-celled organisms, and interestingly to uh, the cells responsible for producing bone, the osteocytes, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those again as we go. And the other major correlation that you see across different species is not just cell size, which is a positive correlation, but a negative relationship between genome size and cell division rate. So the summary then is a large genome tends to be found in a large, slowly dividing cell. So what are some of the possible consequences of that relationship at the organism level? I can think of three really obvious possibilities. One, the most simple, is just body size. So if I increase the size of every cell in the body and I don't change cell number, I should get a bigger body. So that's one possibility. The other is that cells like uh, red blood cells, but also all cells that are exchanging ions and so on, are affected by surface area volume ratio changes. So if I make a bigger cell, I might have differences in gas exchange rates or ion exchange rates that correspond to, for example, metabolic rate differences, physiological differences. And that third possibility that I have in mind is development. So if you imagine development as being not just cell growth, but cell division, then you could imagine a slowing down of every cell division event might correspond to a difference in developmental rate, all else we need. So those are the three things that I want to talk about in the next little bit. We've looked at body size in a few groups, and that includes some soft-bodied stuff like flatworms, as well as hard-bodied things like crustaceans. And in some cases, in invertebrates anyway, you do see this relationship. It's not universally true, and I think in part because, for example, in mammals, most of the difference in body size is actually due to difference in cell number, and not cell size. So for example, a whale versus a shrew don't differ in cell size that much. They differ in cell number. But in cases where the variation in cell number is fairly small, or even potentially constant if they have cell number constancy, you do find this positive relationship with genome size. So it, it, it happens. I'm not going to say it's universal. I don't think it's a major explanatory kind of relationship in any way, but it is interesting that it shows up in, in various groups. One of the ones that's been discussed a lot more is the relationship or a possible relationship with metabolic rate or things like flightability or other things that are contingent on metabolic capacity. And in this case, you're looking at resting metabolic rate measured as uh, mass specific oxygen consumption versus genome size means are mass corrected, so this is after body size differences are taken out. And even though there's only a two-fold difference in genome size across birds, you still see this inverse correlation between genome size and metabolic rate in birds. So people have looked at this and tried to see if it does indeed correspond to actual differences in uh, things like flightability. So there are some attempts that try to categorize birds of different species as flightless, which isn't so hard to do. Uh, but then you start getting into weak versus moderate versus strong flyers, and is gliding strong flight, or is ability to take off and maneuverable strong flight, and see where the problems uh, start to come in. Nevertheless, it is fairly interesting that the largest genomes in birds tend to be found in flightless birds, and the smallest genomes tend to be found in what, at least in this early version of the analysis, were labeled as strong 
But we weren't really happy with that, so we wanted to generate a uh, consistent data set where we measured the genome sizes of everything in the data set and look at a parameter that is more closely related to flight in a way that isn't so subjective. Like you're deciding which one is a good fly or not. So we combined our own genome size data set for a bunch of different passerine birds that we collected and data from a uh, collection of images of wings from a museum and measured wing loading index, which is sort of a measure that they use in the aeronautics industry, for example, to talk about uh, wing design and how much lift it would generate and so on. And we found, even when we correct for body size and phylogenetic relationships, you still see this association between genome size and wing loading index, which we took as uh, a much better piece of evidence that, in fact, flightability or evolution of best flight adaptations is related to uh, small genome size. Now, it seems like a no-brainer, but if you're really interested in this strong flyer comparison, you would look at hummingbirds. The problem is nobody had looked at a hummingbird. The second problem is there's only one hummingbird in Ontario, and you're not allowed to catch it. <laughs> so, um, and I don't know that I could anyway. So, there are no data on hummingbirds. Well, we got very lucky and had this great collaboration with some colleagues who are based in New Mexico who do work in South America and they uh, provided us with a great data set or uh, sample set of um, hummingbirds and it turns out hummingbirds not only have the smallest genomes of birds, they also have the smallest blood cells I've ever seen in birds. And so this is them as compared to the normal range of cell size versus genome size just among other birds. And the question always comes up, what about bats? Yes, bats actually also have smaller genome sizes. In fact, all bats have genomes smaller than the mammalian average. And interestingly, it turns out that megabats, the, again, problematic taxonomic category of note, the large uh, frugivorous bats in, in uh, Therapodidae tend to have even smaller genomes than what are traditionally called the microbats. Why that is, I'm not entirely sure. So as part of this discussion, I, I made this uh, point, which is, what we don't know in a historical sense is whether bird genomes and other genomes of flying vertebrates started out small and stayed small, or whether they got small, perhaps as part of the evolution of flight. So using the analogy of flying machines, I said it's not clear whether they jettisoned their genomic baggage or it was never loaded. Um, I could have said it was lost by Air Canada, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> it's really difficult to answer a question like that with only modern species. You can do phylogenetic inferences and things like that, but the best way to get at this would be to look at fossil data. The problem is, genomes don't fossilize, at least not on the time scale that we're interested in here. You don't get that kind of evidence. But what does fossilize is the space left behind by osteocytes. And so some colleagues uh, who then were based at Harvard, what they did was they looked, took thin sections of bone of dinosaurs, of different groups of dinosaurs, and looked at the spaces that were left behind by the osteocytes. And they calibrated the size of those spaces versus genome size in living species, and were able to infer what the genome sizes of different groups of dinosaurs were. They've done the same thing with pterosaurs as well. And it turns out that, yes, dinosaurs, at least theropod dinosaurs that are of the same lineage as modern birds, had smaller genomes than other dinosaurs. Pterosaurs also had smaller genomes than their non-flying relatives at the same time. So here's what they show. This is a summary from a, a related news report. And so dinosaurs that are of the same clade as, as modern birds had smaller genomes than these others. They were already smaller prior to the evolution of flight. So the argument was that genome sizes, yes, had been reduced in that lineage, but they had also begun that reduction prior to the evolution of power flight. And I think that's actually um, perfectly consistent with what we know about the evolution of flight, because feathers also appeared prior to the evolution of flight. And bipedal locomotion also appeared prior to the evolution of flight. And various other structural modifications also appeared prior to the evolution of flight. So it's not that surprising that genome sizes were also being reduced prior to the evolution of flight in that particular lineage. Those uh, dinosaurs that, that have the smaller genomes as compared to the non-avian dinosaurs did not have as small as genomes as modern birds, certainly not as small as hummingbird. 
So there's continued reduction, just like there's further modifications of feathers, further modifications of musculature, and respiratory system, and so on, in the strong flying birds. So it's, it's consistent with, with that basic story. Now, people have been interested in um, birds because you can get at this sort of flight question, but birds, in terms of genome size diversity, are not that interesting. They don't vary across species very much. Amphibians, on the other hand, is about a 120-fold difference from the smallest to the largest genome. And so it's a much more challenging puzzle to kind of understand why that is. People have tried to use the same kind of uh, explanation, namely metabolic constraints for amphibians. And in fact, if you look at temperature-controlled, mass-corrected, metabolic rate, and oxygen consumption versus genome size across all amphibians, you do find a significant negative correlation. Problem is, this is the classic example of why you need phylogenetic correction in a lot of analyses like these. Because it's really just two big clusters of points. It's not 50 independent points, it's two major plates. And within the frogs and within the salamanders, the relationship is not very strong at all, if even not significant. In salamanders, it's significant, but only if you include this sort of extreme case of amphiuma. So I've argued, well, this doesn't seem to be very consistent with that huge range being an adaptive uh, sort of um, pattern that relates to metabolic rates. So the argument had been, look, if you're an aquatic salamander, you live in stagnant water, and the oxygen availability is low, so you need to be able to slow down metabolism and things like that. And I don't think that's a very good explanation. So then people say, well, okay, maybe it's water breathing. In fact, that you're in the water. Uh, there's lower uh, dissolved oxygen in water than there is in the air. So that's why. Okay, the problem with that is that amphiuma and others may live in the water, but they still have lungs and breathe air. The large, some of the largest genomes in, in salamanders are found in terrestrial species, like plethodontids, which I'll come back to in a second. And we look at teleost fishes. They have very small genomes, generally, versus lung fishes that have enormous genomes. So I don't think water breathing is going to explain that difference either. Okay, maybe it's estimation, though. The fact that sometimes some of these salamanders encounter uh, poor conditions and they have to basically burrow or cocoon themselves or otherwise uh, enter a state of estimation where they slow their metabolic rate way down, those times are when you need to have great big cells. Well, the problem with that is you also see estimation, and in this case, this is again oxygen use in one of these salamanders, but two other examples. In this case, two different species of desert dwelling frogs that can also lower their metabolic rates down pretty much as far during estivation and have maybe a 50 fold smaller genome size. So it's unlikely that you need to have a 50 gigabase genome in order to estivate when you've got frogs with, a, with genomes smaller than most birds being able to do pretty much the same thing. So I don't think that explains it either. And I'll talk more about those desert dwelling frogs in a second too. So, if it's not metabolism, like it might be in um, endotherms, what's left? Well, the other relationship that I mentioned as a possibility is with developmental rate. So, here is a summary of the things that people have looked at across <coughs> drugs and salamanders. So, you find relationships between genome size and embryonic development, larval development, and even limb regeneration rate, which is what we're looking at there, correspond to uh, genome size. So larger genomes, slower development across these different groups. Now I've tried to find something similar in um, endotherms, looking at both mammals and birds, and that includes things like incubation time, gestation time, uh, various measures of development that you can sort of think of as equivalent people are sharp to that. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any relationship with any of these parameters across either birds or mammals. So on the one hand, we have amphibians that metabolic explanations are probably not very good, but development seems to be pretty uh, reasonable. And in endotherms, in mammals and birds, we see physiological relationships, but not these developmental ones. So kind of flip side, uh, a flip, flip of that story, according to which group you're in. And so it means that the biology of the group in question is, is going to have some effect on which relationship becomes important. Now, I, that first slide with amphibians is just talking about developmental rate. And that's 
just uh, basically how fast you do your development, or how long it takes you to do it. And where you'll see that as a potential correlation is when the species you're comparing are doing about the same amount of development. They're going from the same sort of starting point to roughly the same kind of end point. There's a flip side to that coin, though, which I'm going to call developmental complexity. Again, I don't mean morphological complexity. What I mean is, it's the amount of developing you have to do in a certain amount of time. So instead of thinking about how long does it take me to do it, it's if I have a limited amount of time, how much do I have to do in that time? And if I hold time relatively constant or keep a constraint on available time, I might see some patterns that relate to how much developing is happening. So what I want to do is just take you through um, a very technical uh, summary of patterns of genome size diversity in amphibians. I'll remind you that we're used to thinking about this sort of canonical development called biphasic lifestyle in amphibians where you have an adult, it's semi-terrestrial, you have aquatic larvae, you have metamorphosis into uh, a juvenile that has legs and tails and you, you lose certain features and you know there's and then you become uh, a semi-terrestrial adult. That's not the only lifestyle that exists in amphibians though. So here's my highly technical summary. Um, small, large, and huge genome sizes. And what I'm going to do is just tell you about some different kinds of developmental lifestyles and put them on that scale. So where do you find really small genomes among amphibians? I already hinted at it. You find them in frogs that live in ephemeral pools. So these are things that excavate sometimes for 10 months of the year. And they come out during the wet season, and they go through the life cycle, and then the back in the ground. They have genomes smaller than most birds. Direct developing and biophasic frogs, so these kinds of guys here have larger genomes than that. There's essentially no overlap between frog genome sizes and salamander genome sizes. The salamanders have bigger genomes. So the biophasic and direct developing salamanders are above that. And what gets really interesting is in the neotenic salamanders that don't have metamorphosis, if I start with facultative neotenes, like the axolotl, which essentially won't metamorphose if conditions in the water are good, it'll just stay in the water. If they get lousy, it will metamorphose and move on to land. They have genomes bigger than the direct development and biophasic cell range. Inducible neotenes are ones that I can, not me, others, can inject with thyroxin, and it will metamorphose under those artificial conditions. It has the capacity, but it doesn't do it in nature. They have larger genomes again. And the biggest genomes are things like amphiuma that are called obligate neotenes that can't metamorphose no matter what. You inject them with thyroxine and they die. You don't even have the system for dealing with that normal signal anymore. So they have the largest genomes among amphibians and some of the largest genomes among animals, period. Um, we also looked at developmental parameters in different groups of invertebrates. So as an example, this is development time in, uh, this is from egg to adult in days versus genome size in lady beetles. And then here's an analysis in um, different species of drosophilid flies with development data that are temperature controlled and were taken from the stock centers. So they're basically saying how long it takes each of these species to mature at controlled temperature versus genome size. We also did a phylogenetic correction in, in that study and there's still a relationship. So the bigger the genome, the longer it takes for them to develop. But, again, developmental rate is one issue. More interesting, potentially, is, is developmental complexity or how much developing you're doing. I talked about amphibian metamorphosis. Well, for those of you who are not entomologists, I'll just give you a crash course in insect development. There's basically three major types. One, ametabolous development, no metamorphosis. You just basically start out as a little version of the adult and get bigger. You find this in things like silverfishes. Incomplete metamorphosis, also known as hemimetabolous development, you find in a number of different orders. You find it in things like mypterans and dragonflies and damselflies, in grasshoppers and crickets, roaches, mantids, and so on. And in this case, there's incomplete metamorphosis, meaning you go from egg through a series of nymphal molts into an adult. No complete metamorphosis. And the third type, holometabolous development, has complete metamorphosis, distinct life stages, egg, larva, pupa, adult. Why am I telling you this? Well, when I was 
first playing around with the animal genome size database and looking for patterns, and I sort of started thinking about the metamorphosis issue in amphibians, I thought, whoa, insects metamorphose, this should also have really small genomes. And I started looking and I said, oh, okay, that doesn't work. Then, I started categorizing them according to developmental uh, type. And since then, have added hundreds of more species from insects. And this pattern is still pretty, uh, pretty consistent, which is that almost no species, there's one beetle that I don't know about the value for, but uh, there's one beetle, otherwise nothing, that exceeds about 2 billion base pairs in the orders that have complete metamorphosis. In groups that have ametabolist or hemimetabolist development, some of them exceed it by a very wide margin. There are some grasshoppers that have five or six times more DNA than humans can. And as I said, we've been testing this idea now for over 10 years and just looking at uh, patterns across as many different orders as we can. And it's, it's held up quite well. Why it's two billion base pairs, I don't know. Are there other explanations aside from development, like phylogenetic constraints or something? Sure. But it's an interesting thing that, that has actually held up. It corresponds pretty nicely to the amphibian story, I think. Okay, now I said organismal complexity and genome size are not related, and I'm going to stand by that. But developmental complexity might be related, and another type of complexity, organ complexity, how complex a specific organ is, might correlate with genome size. So I don't mean overall intuitive notions of organism complexity. I'm going to talk about specific organs. So I mentioned that amphibian neurons, the size, and also, it turns out, the uh, division rate of those cell types that correspond to genome size. So if you have a larger genome, you tend to have larger and more slowly dividing and differentiating cells. And when people have uh, looked, if you imagine that instead of limiting amount of time, you're now amount, limiting amount of space. Right? You have to fit these things in a skull. When people have looked at a measure of brain complexity versus genome size in both frogs and salamanders, you find that it's negatively correlated with genome size. So the bigger your genome, the simpler some uh, metrics of brain complexity turn out to be. And that has to do, presumably, with having fewer neurons per unit volume, and also they differentiate more slowly, so you end up with less complex neural tissue. So where that gets really interesting is if you look at something like um, Blitoglossine salamanders, they're plethodontids, and they have uh, very extensive body miniaturization. So this is an adult example here. They have uh, very, very small bodies and therefore very, very small skulls, very limited amount of space to hold neurons for the brain. But they also are direct developers and have pretty large genome sizes. So what happens when you combine those two things? A tiny amount of space for the brain and a fairly big genome. It turns out their brains are so simplified, in particular the visual processing centers, are simplified enough that they can't maintain what is thought to be the ancestral strategy of predation, which is visual predation, and instead of have evolved to become lion weight predators, where they wait for stuff to walk by. And secondary to that, they've evolved this projectile tongue, which is pretty much unique among amphibians in that it's about the length of their entire body. So why not just delete extra DNA? I don't know. Maybe there's a pressure that selection among elements within the genome is very strong in these things, and it actually overwhelms selection among organisms and types. That's another discussion. And there's one other interesting observation that I want to make about these salamanders, which is I've said that uh, mammals have enucleated red blood cells, and they're the only group that consistently has that across all species. But there is a, a relatively high, in some cases, 90-95% of red blood cells in some of these miniaturized salamanders that also become enucleated. So here's two species, both with about 40 billion base pair genomes, a red spotted newt, and then one of these miniaturized salamanders. Same magnification. You can see that under the condition of having a normal nucleus, you have these great big cells. And here, in this miniaturized salamander, they've lost the nuclei and they have much smaller cells. I don't think this is explained by metabolic issues. It's probably more about challenges of circulating huge cells through tiny little blood vessels in a little tiny animal like that. But in any case, and it could be that that, that constraint causes the cells to break and they form into this nucleus. But it's one of the only other cases where you find a very large 
percentage of cells that are denucleated outside of mammals. Now, I've been talking a lot about animals, and that's mainly because that's what I work on for the most part. Um, but not only do similar kinds of relationships appear in plants, it's actually the case that uh, botanists are often farther ahead than zoologists in finding these kinds of relationships. So they've been studying this for a long time, and I think that has to do with the fact that they're more uh, familiar with and open to implications of things like polyploidy, for example. And so they've, since the 70s, been documenting examples of pollen size versus genome size, or latitude uh, of growth versus genome size, developmental rate, frost tolerance, CO2 usage, um, and even patterns like this one, which is basically showing that perennial plants tend to have large genomes and annual plants tend to have small genomes. Very similar parallel kinds of relationships also occur in plants, which is, um, which is interesting. So where are we then? When we try to understand this puzzle of genome size diversity, it helps to understand mechanisms that change genome size. So that includes lots of small and large scale changes at the genomic level. It probably involves largely differences in the abundance of transposable elements. And that's an entirely different question about why do some become really uh, dominant or really abundant? Is it always the same kind in different genomes and so on? That's, that's an area that's being actively researched now. But all of these things contribute to genome size, which then affects cell size and cell division. And at least in one model, it affects cell size via cell division. And then those can have implications for organismal features of various sorts, depending on the biology of the group. So maybe metabolic rate or body size or organ complexity or development, depending on whether you have metamorphosis or don't, whether you're an endotherm or not, whether you have cell number constancy in your body or not, and so on. And all of those can have cascading effects on the ecology of these organisms. So whether you can fly or whether you can visually hunt food and so on. But it's also a top-down relationship. So you've got ecological lifestyles like uh, becoming a strong flyer can impose pressures on physical features like metabolism and development, which affects cell size and division, which affects genome size, which affects how much this non-coding DNA can accumulate. And sometimes you'll see changes such as loss of flight and an increase in genome size or loss of metamorphosis and increase in genome size as those constraints are released. So it's a complicated relationship involving multiple levels of selection, but I think that's probably a better way of going about it than just saying, hey, it's all doing X and we're done. Um, those approaches have been around for decades and they haven't worked. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have, and thanks for listening. I feel like I should be dissecting a horse down here or something. <laughs> So some lineages have full genome duplication. Yep. Do you think that could be a confounding factor in this type of analysis? Like, um, whether there be expansions because of that or because of principles of all of it? Yeah. So that's sort of two things. So probably a very large proportion of lineages at some point have a, a genome duplication. Um, it depends when that was and, how, and whether there's, there's more recent um, contributions made by that process. So for example, if you look at vertebrates, uh, other than the teleos fishes, there's just the two events early, early on, and everything you're seeing here is since then, right? So, in that case, probably not. Um, in other cases, if you look at within teleos, and uh, you say which fishes tend to have large genomes in, in the bony fishes and which ones don't, it's the ancient polyploids. It's the, the salmonids and other things that probably it's because of that. So, the answer is yes and no. Um, I will say that, so the other issue is that genome size and ploidy, I usually try to keep them as separate things because genome size is changing the total quantity of DNA, so is polyploidy, but it's not duplicating all the genes and all the regulatory regions and all that other stuff. It's often the accumulation of non-coding things. So, and it also can happen on a different time scale. So it may or may not be equivalent in a lot of cases. In terms of the most of the patterns that I showed in vertebrates, that wouldn't be polyploidy. That's since the, the, the most recent duplication. It's a good question. <laughs>